I'm really excited to have you join us here for the second annual Penn Nursing Innovation Accelerator Pitch Event. And this is the first one that we've done virtually for, uh, for reasons that you can imagine. Today's pitch event showcases nurses in what we are, natural innovators. Whether nurses are at the bedside, in the community, in the research lab, or in the boardroom, wherever nurses and nurse scientists practice and do research, we routinely create new solutions to the problems we face every single day. The Innovation Accelerator Initiative is an exceptional opportunity for Penn Nursing students and faculty and our partners to develop these new ideas. Even though the global pandemic interrupted some of the plans we had from last year's participants, the breadth and the depth of entrepreneurial ideas presented was nothing short of spectacular. And I look forward to hearing the latest round of pitches for innovative solutions. Some of our participants from this pitch event will receive funding for the creation and testing of their early stage solutions for health and healthcare greatest problems. These participants, chosen by a panel of esteemed judges from Philadelphia's innovation and entrepreneurship communities, will provide solutions that serve populations with the greatest need. I want to thank all of our judges for being here with us tonight. I want to emphasize that all of our participants are winners for de developing their ideas, for putting them out there, and they in turn will receive invaluable feedback for their next steps, wherever that takes them. The pitch event gets to the very heart of what Penn Nursing is all about. Innovation is the through line of everything we do. Our students and faculty are prepared to lead with vision, and they are encouraged to think big and to think differently. It isn't just about who can come up with the most unique idea. It's about who can come up with an idea and or a solution that can be implemented and will revolutionize healthcare and transform health. I've been very much looking forward to the Innovation Accelerator pitch event. The pandemic has impacted so much of our lives but it will never put a pause on the ingenuity and creativity of our faculty and students. This event and this initiative showcases the incredible ecosystem we have here at Penn and at Penn Nursing. I wanna thank members of our faculty, Dr. George Demiris, Marion Leary, Dr. Terry Richmond from Penn Nursing, and Melissa Kelly from the Penn Center for Innovation who have spearheaded this effort. And of course, thanks to all who submitted applications and thanks to all of you who are here with us tonight. Before I turn things over to Marion Leary, Penn Nursing's Director of Innovation and Mistress of Ceremonies for today's event, I want to remind everyone that the World Health Organization decided last year was the year of the nurse and midwife. And given the oversized manner in which the pandemic highlighted the importance of our public health work, the WHO has extended the celebration into 2021. Today's pitch event demonstrates the best of what nursing as a profession has to offer and highlights the role of Penn Nursing in driving health and health innovation. The Innovation Accelerator Pitch Day event is one of many ways Penn Nursing will be continuing to celebrate, elevate, and advocate for nurses and midwives during the extended year of the nurse and midwife and throughout the end of our Innovation for Living Life, Life and Living campaign. So stay tuned to learn about what Penn Nursing and our partners have planned for the year. And of course, I encourage you to find a way to support our campaign and the innovation it has championed at our school. At today's pitch event, you may be seeing tomorrow's most daring and effective innovation in healthcare. And I congratulate everyone who submitted applications to the Innovation Accelerator and to those pitching those ideas today. Thanks again for being with us. And with that, I give you Mary and Larry. Hi everyone, I'm Marion Leary. I am the Director of Innovation here at Penn Nursing. Welcome to our second annual Penn Nursing Innovation Accelerator Pitch Event. I am so excited for you all to hear our faculty, students, and clinicians pitch their innovation ideas. The way this is going to work, each team of presenters will have six minutes to present their problem and solution to our esteemed panel of judges. And then I will moderate four minutes of questions. During the pitches, our visual artist, Rachel Acker from Health Hero, will be live sketching the finalist presentations, which will be a ton of fun to watch. Our judges this year include Linda Benton, Senior Director of Johnson & Johnson, Adam Denkin, Managing Director of Dream It Ventures, Rich Genzer, Director of Investment at Ben Franklin Tech Partners, 
Tony Green, Vice President, Science and Technology at Ben Franklin Tech Partners, Jaharam Hajazi, Partner at BioAdvance, Rich Panola, Co-Chair of the Penn Nursing Innovation Committee, and Brett Topes, Managing Director of Red and Blue Ventures. I want to thank them all for being here today and providing feedback to our finalists. Once all the finalists have pitched, the judges will leave the virtual room to confer. While this is taking place, we have a keynote talk from Ernesto Hooligan, founder of O10 Medical. Following his talk, we will announce the winner or winners of the Innovation Accelerator Pitch Competition. And the winner or winners will receive up to $10,000 to help develop and test their innovations, as well as go through a 10 month accelerator program offering mentorship and education from both the Penn and Philadelphia innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystems. If you're interested in potentially mentoring one of our teams, please let me know. Last year at our inaugural pitch event, we were awarded three winners to go through the accelerator program. And as uh, the Dean mentioned, um, last year had some challenges. Um, and so the accelerator that was slated to start in March of 2020, as we are all well aware, um, changed dramatically due to the pandemic and we weren't able to move many of the teams forward. But we did have one team um, who was able to move forward with Dr. Pam Caccione. And so she's going to be talking to us tonight uh, about her work and experience over those past 10 months um, as the winner of last year's Penn Nursing Innovation Accelerator pitch event. So I'd like to now welcome Dr. Pam Pacione, um, and uh, she will pre be presenting on the work she did as part of this accelerator program last year. I am um, delighted to be here. I wanna remind you just basically of the story that my um, brother, let me do it in, beginning um, that my brother was the impetus for this um, idea when he developed heart failure at the age of 40 after open heart surgery and refused to weigh himself and I came to the conclusion that I needed to develop heart failure monitoring socks so that I could identify the displacement from edema and send it to an app so that we could identify um, heart failure exacerbations early these are the initial prototype that was developed, the second prototype that I um, talked about at last year's and the low-tech prototype. I have focused on the high-tech prototype this year. This was um, progress since last year. This, um, if you can see the um, stretch sensors around, this was a very interesting prototype that worked on um, Kayo, my engineering student, but did not work on older adults because of clips and things that were a little more complicated. So we went to this next prototype. And then um, one of my board members, executive board members, Dr. Nalika Gunaratne introduced me to Tevery, who had a liquid metal stretch sensor. So if you can see the, um, the size of our previous stretch sensor and how difficult it was to adhere to the sock, this is the new liquid stretch sensor. And it's very exciting. Um, we prototype now with a band at the top of the sock um, with a um, larger box than I would like, but we're still working. And this is how the stretch sensors um, inside the top of the sock. One of the biggest problems for Tevery is the um, sewing, seamlessly sewing a sock to engage this um, stretch sensor that you see here. So I'm very excited to be moving forward with that. I had throughout the, um, 10 months I had mentorship from John Pendergrass. Um, he was invaluable. We had monthly check-ins. He had a wealth of resources to share with me. He's really pushing me to think about business, the business end of things, and pushing me to think about my goals for the smart socks or the heart failure monitoring socks. I also participated in the Penn i program last um, winter doing um, with a little help from George Demiris, which was greatly appreciated. 20 interviews with different um, healthcare sectors that might use the heart failure monitoring socks. Um, the big issue was how is it gonna be reimbursed and who's gonna pay for it? Um, nursing homes actually seem like a good possibility because uh, nursing home weights are notoriously unreliable. Physicians would get reimbursed for this, so that's an opportunity as well. But the bottom line is I have to have the evidence that shows that it works. So our next uh, steps are to continue prototyping with Tevery. 
They promised a deliverable of 20 pairs of socks to test with older adults with heart failure if COVID allows. Um, I've had several offers from home care as well as the PACE model to test in a population of older adults. I applied for the ANA Innovation Award, got really positive feedback, but did not get funded. So I would try and reapply for that. And then the Penn Health Tech Award this spring and um, thinking about an SBIR and STTR with um, Tevery as well. And one of the things that I really want to emphasize is my thanks to uh, Marin Leary, who has been also so diligent in supporting me throughout this year and even allowing me to continue despite COVID. I just was so grateful to be able to continue prototyping and working on this opportunity and look forward to continuing to move it forward. So it's a wonderful opportunity to, um, and I'm so, so grateful. So thank you. Well, great. Thank you, Pam. Uh, really great work that you were able to do over this past year. I'm really happy that you were able to continue despite everything going on with the pandemic. All right. So now I'm really excited to begin our pitch event. I'm going to bring up, bring up, virtually bring up our first team of pitch presenters. Dr. Kimberly Trout, Assistant Professor of Women's Health at Penn Nursing. Stephanie Madri, Clinical Adjunct Professor at Penn Nursing, and Dr. James Weimer, Research Assistant Professor at the Penn School of Engineering and Applied Science, who will be presenting on their postpartum hemorrhage detection application. Um, and if you all could turn on your screens, whoever is presenting, and Anthony, if you can please turn on Rachel Acker's screen. Rachel Acker from Health Hero will be live sketching the pitches during this event as well. Whenever you all are ready, feel free to begin. And I will be, this is a six minute pitch, so I will be timing six minutes. And once you are finished pitching, we'll bring on the judges and they will ask questions for four minutes. Marion, can you hear me? This is Stephanie. Yes, you sound good. And can you see my screen in full? Yes, it looks great. Okay, great. Um, I think I'm ready to go. Okay, hello today, oh, sorry. Ah, sorry, thank just go back. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, hello, today we are talking about a non-invasive wearable early postpartum hemorrhage detection device and software. We aim to be in every birth globally to affect change for mothers, to make their birth safer, to save lives, and to save a significant amount of money. Postpartum hemorrhage is a large loss of blood, whether immediately after or delayed by several hours after the birth, and it's the leading cause of maternal death worldwide. Postpartum hemorrhage is a preventable condition. However, it can kill a mother in two hours. It's a Healthy People 2030 goal to reduce maternal deaths and severe maternal complications related to hospitalization. Government agencies, hospitals, and insurance companies have a strong interest in this goal as costs related to hemorrhage are close to $1 billion. Um, if you read the headlines, more mothers are dying of PPH every day. To add, there are also healthcare disparities um, between white versus non-white women. According to the CDC, rates of postpartum hemorrhage per delivery have increased fourfold over the last 20 years in terms of requiring a blood transfusion and also obstetric procedures to control the hemorrhage. For every death related to PPH, there are 50 women that survive, but yet they suffer severe complications. And unfortunately, the US has the highest maternal death rate out of all developed countries by far. There are 30,000 blood transfusions given annually and delivery costs double with a postpartum hemorrhage. Um, usually related to medications, OR time, blood, ICU time, and staff labor. If Florence Nightingale measured a soldier's blood loss in the hospital tents in 1850 by counting soaked rags, and we still did that today, it would seem archaic. And currently, all maternal health care workers in the U.S. and across the globe rely on the same archaic methods to detect for postpartum hemorrhage. We check the mother's pad. But how often it's done? It is not always happening according to the schedule that it should because the unit may be incredibly busy. There may be other critical mothers. There may be issues related to other babies. 
or the healthcare staff, if they are not trained, they may not know exactly what to do. And relying on vital signs is not good enough because oftentimes uh, changes in heart rate and blood pressure are late indicators of a maternal blood volume change. So if an alarm isn't heard, if the patient isn't believed, if the vital signs are inaccurate, then nothing may be done, it may be too late, and we may lose a mom. The project's mission is to develop a patentable software algorithm that can non-invasively detect a hemorrhage sooner. Monitoring takes place through the skin using red light, green light, and optical skin sensor technology. Multiple benefits can be reached, such as significant hospital and insurance cost savings, even the lives of mothers, the ability to work with other wireless monitoring devices, and to be another set of eyes and ears for the healthcare team. Currently, no one is working in this space, and a novel pilot will expand upon earlier published algorithm work done by our teammate, Dr. Weimer. A large portion of the US's 3.7 million births were done in less than 100 hospitals, hoping to make our initial hospital marketing efforts more focused. We envision the software in various wearable devices that can be used in both the advanced hospitals in the US and in developing countries with birth attendants using it in coordination with a mobile app. Iterations will be available to use to communicate with the EMR directly and also available in trauma, ER, cardiac, med surge, and more. An important thing to note is that the current existing solutions only work towards what to do after it has been detected, which may often be too late. The business model is based upon a device with our software and licensing the patented software. The end buyers will be hospitals, insurance companies, and global NGOs. We're exploring health insurance reimbursement mechanisms as they'll be interested in the potential cost savings. And the next goal is to complete a pilot study and pursue IP protection. Our pilot study aims to assess 1,000 mothers in childbirth in order to capture 50 to 75 postpartum hemorrhages. We will then evaluate our data refine our algorithm, and work to both publish and patent. We aim to start this in the spring of 2021. We are here today to ask for financial support for our proof of concept pilot study to develop this algorithm and, and then eventually publish our data. We have a large market potential with nearly 4 million births per year in the US and 140 globally. There are over 2,000 hospitals offering obstetric services and it's possible that a hospital may only need to, need to spend $7 per patient to have our software system in place to save thousands of dollars per year. Our nursing, engineering, and entrepreneurial team are highly experienced and know what is needed to save the lives of mothers and to save money. We have a nearly 60 years of combined work experience. In closing, postpartum hemorrhage is preventable occurrence and a preventable death. However, it's difficult to assess an ID early, and instead, by capitalizing on an approach based upon public technology and predicate devices, the U.S. can become a leader in saving the lives of women in childbirth globally and saving money. Thank you for your time and consideration. Great, thank you. Stephanie. Would you like me to stop, to, to stop sharing at this point? Um, sure. Yeah, Anthony, um, can you bring on all of our judges? Or um, actually, judges, can you please turn on your videos? Hello. Great. Thank you. Um, who who would like to start off asking questions? I'm sorry, I can't see all of you, so please just um, speak up. I'll be happy to start. Uh, first of all, very interesting and obviously uh, important problem. Real quick, I, I may have missed this. What is your sensor actually measuring? And what is the status of the prototype? And you say you want to start put, do your pilot study. Is, in fact, your prototype ready for that pilot study? So I'm going to let our teammate Jim Weimer go ahead and answer that question. Yeah. Hello. Uh, this is Jim. Um, so the status is we're going to use a Samsung watch commercially available. 
Uh, we already have a platform to collect basically the green light on the back. That should be enough for what we need to do. Uh, this is based upon prior published research that I've done on detecting hypovolemia, which is a type which, of which uh, postpartum hemorrhage is a type of, uh, using the PPG signal from uh, the, the pulse oximeter. Uh, and it's effectively the same sensor. So we're ready to go. We just need the uh, funding to get up and going. All the software and devices are, are in place. This is Rick. Uh, great presentation. Uh, do you know why the rates are in, uh, increasing? Like um, why? We, I don't know if we know that just yet. Um, they've looked at it in so many different angles. Um, you know, we do have a significant rise in preeclampsia, which can be a contributor to it. Um, if a woman has poor nutrition before or during her pregnancy, she could be anemic, which it could also contribute to uh, postpartum hemorrhage. We also have a great rise in C-sections. About one in third births are done by C-section, and that can also increase the chance of uh, a hemorrhage. So those, and you know, we have increase with multiples related to IVF. Um, uh, and, and you know what, I think also a function of it is, is that a lot of smaller obstetric hospitals have closed, and it's funneled a lot more patients into a, um, into a, in, in a bit of a, like a factory situation. And I honestly, I think that the nurses and the staff are really, really stretched thin. So it's a multifactorial issue. Thank you. Yes, so, if I could just add, can I just add, we have really have a public health crisis in this country and COVID has magnified that in, in many ways. And childbirth uh, is also susceptible to those disparities that we are seeing with this public health crisis. Uh, so I be also believe that that contributes as well. Were the statistics uh, so much better before uh, the pandemic, uh, you said they spiked because of this factory type of setting. Uh, what were the rates before the pandemic, uh, which started last March? So can I answer that? This has been a problem. This has been a global cause of, number one cause of mortality for a long time. This has been over the past decade. This is not something that just started with the pandemic. I'm just saying that the pandemic is kind of bringing to light the disparities that we have and the, the lack of a coordinated healthcare system in this country, which if you look back at the, at the uh, prior slide, the countries that have lower rates of maternal mortality have well-coordinated health systems with a good public health infrastructure. And that contributes to overall health. And therefore, um, you know, that's a factor in this increase in maternal deaths. All right, we have time for just one more question. Are there, it's Adam, good presentation. Are there different levels of hemorrhage, and, you know, and are some sort of more clinically significant than others? And sort of the reason I'm asking that question is the segue to, right, sounds like you're gonna have to do a little bit of work to dial in the specificity and the sensitivity, right? Because we don't wanna, I, I don't know, but I'm assuming some bleeds just may be minor, not clinically significant, and others are things you wanna intervene on right away. You know, how, how difficult do you think that will be? So I'm going to answer uh, a part of that, and I think I'm going to let Jim then answer the other part. So um, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists consider a 500 milliliter blood loss after a vaginal delivery and 1,000 after a C-section to be normal. Um, however, you have some that could be this slow, insidious trickle which actually led to a death of a woman at a local Philadelphia hospital within just the last two years, where it was like, oh, it's probably not too much, probably not too much, and then, oh my gosh, she now on the verge of death. She's, she's like in shock. Um, and you have others that are very large and very apparent. And one of the things that we're gonna try to look for in doing this pilot is to actually Hopefully that we'll be able to see some of those natural compensating mechanisms that a woman's body has because during her pregnancy, her blood volume is increasing 30 to 60 percent. And so we want to see if we can see some of the changes on the, the data we collect to see if we can see, oh, OK, that kind of looks like normal compensation. 
and then whoa, this is this is that big difference that could that that then we correlate later and say, yep, she had a hemorrhage, and maybe our data was able to see it. We'll let Jim answer. Yeah, yeah Adam, I'll I'll do all the math. Stephanie uh, just spoke about. Uh, so, you know, we'll be tuning in sensitivity, sensitivity specificity uh, using tried and true statistical techniques. And of course, all the issues you mentioned are things that we fully can study in that 1,000 patient trial. So tuning it in is something that we're going to do in this pilot. Got it. Great. Thank you all very much for a great presentation, for kicking us off. Thank you, Thank you. everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Next up, I'd like to welcome Sarah Cronin and Brooke Goodspeed, two grad students at Penn Nursing, who are going to be presenting their innovation, the Stay Safe, which they created in our Penn Nursing Innovation and in Health course last spring. This is the first group of students from that class to present at the pitch event, so I'm very excited to welcome them and hear their pitch. Great. You guys are good to go whenever you're ready. Great. Can you see us and everything? Yes, um, I don't see your screen though. Right. Can everyone see and hear me? Yes, and Anthony, can you bring Rachel Acker's screen back up also? Give me one second with the share screen. There it is, okay. All right, how does that look, everyone? Looks good. Great, okay. All right, Brooke, you want to take it away? Ready? Okay. Good evening. My name is Brooke Goodspeed, and today my colleague Sarah Cronin and I are going to tell you about a simple yet innovative product that will be life-saving for children on the autism spectrum. I am a parent of a child on the autism spectrum. I fear for my son's safety every day because I have lived through a parent's worst nightmare. This is a picture of my 10-year-old son, Oliver, who has autism. One evening in December of 2019, Oliver walked out of our front door, down the driveway, and continued for several blocks before he eloped, and he was found in the middle of the street. It was a cold, dark evening, and he was barefoot and in his pajamas. This happened despite locks on the door, three adults in the home, and never having done this before. Unfortunately, I'm not alone, and there is no amount of money that I wouldn't pay to keep my child safe. Wandering, which is also known as elopement, is a common problem for children on the autism spectrum. In fact, elopement is the number one contributing factor to death and disability for children with ASD. It is estimated that half of children with autism have attempted elopement, and these elopements are dangerous, with one in three events having an outcome that is fatal or requires medical attention. So we've created the Stay Safe bracelet, which is the solution. As a mom who's experienced elopement, as nurses who understand this population and this problem, we've des designed this solution with the following five features. Number one, it has real-time alert system. As you can see here in a quick clip from our low fidelity prototype video, the caregiver is alerted immediately when the child crosses the boundary. Number two, the geofencing for our product is completely customizable and can be individualized to any boundary you want. Three, most people don't think of this, but we understand that it absolutely needs to be sensory friendly. It locks with the proprietary locking system that is only accessible via the caregiver bracelet. And lastly, it incorporates behavioral reinforcers such as music or a light show that will play if a child does not elope. This alone is an invaluable tool for teaching safety and awareness of the home environment. Great, thanks Brooke. So autism is the fastest growing developmental disability and in the US it's estimated that one in 54 children have autism. Its incidence has increased by up to 15% each year and continues to be on the rise. So this problem is not going away. The market size for this product is substantial. There are an estimated 700,000 at-risk children with ASD between the ages of 1 and 12. All of these children are potential users for the Stay Safe. Priced at the cost of a smartwatch, about $300 a bracelet, our total addressable market is $210 million. 
The StaySafe is a clearly differentiated product on the market, hitting all major pain points identified in our preliminary interviews with caregivers. No other innovation addresses elopement in ASD specifically, nor most importantly, provide real-time alerts. Our main advantage is we have a specific and targeted group of people who need this product. In our preliminary interviews with parents, everyone we spoke to had a story like Brooks and was desperate for someone, some way to reliably keep their children safe. Additionally, the autism community is a tight-knit group that generally shares resources readily, so because of this, our market entry approach will begin locally and direct to consumer in phase one. In Pennsylvania alone, there are an estimated 20,000 individuals with autism, a quarter of whom are in the Philadelphia and surrounding counties, so we hope to leverage our established relationships in this area, resulting in conservative 10% market penetration of $600,000 in phase one from bracelet sales alone. In phase two, we aim to expand nationally and gain coverage by insurance companies, including Medicaid, partner with national organizations like Autism Speaks for marketing outreach. Down the line, we hope to have an option to partner with companies in pharma, medical devices, or health tech to scale up and address the remaining children with autism nationally, again, with a conservative 10% market penetration of $21 million. In terms of future iterations, essentially any population at risk of elopement would be able to find a use for this. The possibilities here are endless, including expanding to other developmental disability populations, dementia patients, locked patient units in hospitals, or school settings for kids with neurodevelopmental differences. So this is our team. You know Brooke Goodspeed, but what you don't know is that she's also the CEO and founder of Get Included, a successful nonprofit benefiting those with neurodevelopmental differences, and she's a fourth-year PhD student researching ASD. I'm Sarah Cronin. I have a previous master's in business and science, experience in biotech and reimbursement, and I'm currently pursuing my nurse practitioner degree in psychiatry mental health with a minor in autism. Kevin Thomas is our engineering advisor. He is a Penn graduate in engineering and currently works at Amazon. He has previous experience developing apps, is highly knowledgeable about GPS technology and applicability, software development, and project management. So our team's ask is for funding to launch to stay safe and keep, help, our, help keep our children safe. Using data from our preliminary surveys, we're hoping to move forward in building the device and app, conduct proof of concept testing with five initial bracelets, conduct data analysis based on these initial tests, and refine the prototype with the goal of testing with 20 bracelets. In order to do this, we're asking for a budget of $9,925, and here's a quick itemized budget. Keeping in mind these words from social psychologist Brené Brown, that terrifying night of great vulnerability for my family has been the catalyst for this innovative solution for protecting children with ASD from the devastating consequences of elopement. My family was fortunate that our son survived elopement unscathed. Our goal at Stay Safe is to hope that horrible nightmare it keep that horrible nightmare from being any family's reality. We believe we have the experience, vision, and solution to do this, and we hope that you do too. Thanks for your attention. And some references. Great. Thank you guys so much for that presentation. All right, um, Anthony, could you bring the judges on, please? Great, and you'll have four minutes of questions from our panel of judges. Who would like to start? I'll, I'll jump in. Nice presentation, uh, Sarah and Brooke. Um, clearly, I, I definitely get it. I mean, that's got to be. I remember when I when my daughter got lost in a grocery store once, and I thought I was going to have a stroke. Um, so this has to be like way worse than that. <laughs> so you know, any any parent, this is going to clearly resonate. Um, I did a quick internet search. And at least according to Pinterest, there are over 20 companies that make very similar devices. So I'm really curious on what the different, you didn't have a competition slide unless I missed it. Um, you know, I'm really curious on how you differentiate from all the solutions that are out there and what sort of IP you think you'll be able to get to protect this. Sure. So um, I'll start with this, Brooke. Uh, we did have a competitive analysis slide. It was a little brief, though, but um, we did a lot of research on the other products out there. And the main thing we found is that there are a lot of like passive monitoring for where your child is. So you can look up where they are or keep track of where they go. But the main issue that we were trying to pinpoint is kids leaving home when people are home and nobody knows. So it's kind of like a where did Jimmy go or something like that. Um, so that's really the pin the pain point that we're going for, less so a sort of passive tracking system for other kids or for your kids. I mean, Brooke, you want to add in? 
Um, yes, I mean, I think that what we're doing here really is leveraging existing technology and refining a, our solution to address in a very specific and careful and thoughtful way this one problem of elopement from a safe place in the home or a building. And, and I guess that speaks to Adam's uh, other part of his question, which is, what can you protect here that a competitor can't just grab? Geofencing is used for everything right now, um, mm-hmm. and um, you know, I, I, I guess my question is, is how do you? This is a marketing muscle play, as much as anything else, unless there's something I'm missing. No, I'm, there's a few things we can patent. I mean, one thing is that um, we're ha- we have a unique application for existing technology. We also have um, a locking device. The locking system is patentable. And I think the power in this bracelet is really in the behavioral therapy component, because if anyone is familiar with this patient population, children with autism have limited danger awareness. Someone like my son will have limited danger awareness for possibly the rest of his life. So if I want to go to the bathroom, I have to bring him with me or he because he's in danger of elopement. And that's extremely meaningful with what we're trying to do here, because we want to have a way to show parents and kids, like, how do we stay safe? We're going to provide visually stimulating things like this flashing device, um, music, and parents will have the option to consult with our behavioral consults to help evaluate how they best can keep their child safe. You know, and this, like the thing with dog fences or other geo fences is they're not customizable and the GPS technology is very, not it's not precise so we will be um using bluetooth and new gps technology apparently that's come out sarah you can speak more to that yeah um well if people want to hear about it there is future directions that we're considering for maybe like the 2.0 version of this that involves um, a more exact form of of monitoring where someone is so, so um, we are at time, Linda, I think you'll be the last question. Okay, so it's kind of in the same vein. So I saw, obviously, this would be set up in your home currently, but could that technology also be utilized in the child's school or if you were at another person's home or is it strictly for the home environment? That is the dream of making it customizable to separate spaces. So like, let's say you have a setting for school and you have a setting for the home and you have a setting for grandma's house or something like that. And you can kind of activate it depending on where you guys are. That is where we're hoping to get to. But right now we're really just focusing on, okay, everybody's at home and we're all at dinner and someone's occupied with another kid and Jimmy leaves and nobody notices. And so that's kind of where we're coming from. But that's a great idea for future directions. Super interesting. Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much. Great presentation. Brooke. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next up, uh, we have Liz Harbuck, a Penn Nursing Master's student who will be presenting her solution, Milk Ease. Anthony, if you can bring up uh, Rachel Acker's video again as well, that'd be great. And judges, you can turn your videos off. Great, thank you. All right, Liz, whenever you're ready. And you're on you're on mute. That should be. All right, you're off mute, but we lost your screen share. Okay, I think we're good now, right? Yes, great. Hi, my name is Liz Harbuck. I am a nurse, a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm also the founder of Milky's, a lactation product. So this is a picture of my family uh, in 2018. This was two days before I returned to work after maternity leave. 
Um, I knew that I wanted to breastfeed my daughter and I wanted to be prepared when I returned to work. So I started to pump while I was on maternity leave. I was able to pump about a thousand ounces of breast milk and freeze it. And I felt really secure knowing that I had that in case my milk supply dropped or something changed. Um, Sadly, about a day into returning to work, we started to thaw this milk and my daughter started to refuse it. So we noticed that this milk um, smelled a little bit different than fresh milk and we were a little concerned that maybe it had spoiled or we prepared it incorrectly. So I reached out to a lactation consultant who introduced this idea of having high lipase. So lipase is an enzyme, it breaks down fats. And so the longer that milk is stored for, the more fats are broken down and the more likelihood that this milk might smell or taste different and be refused by an infant. So current recommendations are to heat this milk before freezing it to decrease the lipase levels. Um, so unfortunately, I had already had all of this milk frozen uh, and I couldn't go back and decrease the lipase. And so I was really disappointed to find out that I wouldn't be able to use any of this milk. Uh, for reference, a thousand ounces of milk took me about 75 hours to pump, which is almost two weeks of full-time work. So to say I was devastated is probably an understatement. <laughs> So lipase, currently the only recommendation to decrease lipase is to do it on a stove top with a thermometer. Um, you're supposed to get it to a specific temperature but not let it boil. Um, this is really time intensive for people who are already feeding, pumping, and washing bottles and pump parts. It's also really stress inducing and something I really hated doing. Um, I was always really concerned that I would overheat the milk and I would actually damage the healthy properties of breast milk. And so I really wanted to find a way to make this faster or more streamlined. So I came up with this idea of Milkies. So Milkies safely decreases lipase in human milk. Um, it's faster and more efficient than the stovetop heating, and it's also portable for worker travel. So I have heard of some stories where women would have to um, heat their breast milk to decrease the lipase immediately after pumping. So if you're someone who's at work, there's no way you're gonna have access to a stovetop. Um, this could be used anywhere there's an outlet. So in a break room, um, at your desk, on a subway train, you name it. Um, we also plan to market this as a high safety bottle warmer with milk thawing capabilities. So not only would this just be for human milk, it would also be for warming formula, um, but it could also warm um, human milk and thaw frozen milk, which we think is a really important aspect of our product. So we know that infants who are fed human milk have better health outcomes. A couple of these health outcomes that are better are um, less incidence of asthma, um, allergies, diabetes, um, obesity. So in the last couple of decades, this has become a lot more mainstream information. And in 2010, the Affordable Care Act was passed, um, which required all insurances to cover breast pumps at 100 percent. So the amount of people that have been pumping has increased dramatically in the last 11 years. Um, and this problem of having high lipase with storage has also increased. Um, and we know that high lipase activity can contribute to infants rejecting pumped milk. Our market is really large. So um, in 2019, the uh, breast pump market was about $2 billion with a CAGR of 6%. Uh, in 2018, there were almost 4 million deliveries in the US and almost 90% of babies received some amount of breast milk in their first year of life. So we know that our market is expanding um, and is quickly growing. So in 2020, we self-funded our own intellectual property search, and we found that no other products decrease lipase in milk. Um, in our search, we also noticed that no other um, milk warming devices show the user the exact temperature of the milk or formula being warmed. I'm not sure if you've ever prepared milk or formula for an infant, but most bottle warmers have a disclaimer that says you should check the milk or formula on the inside of your wrist before feeding it to your baby to ensure that your baby's not getting burned. Um, there were many times where I would use a basic bottle warmer and I would burn the inside of my wrist or I would notice that the milk wasn't even warmed at all. Um, so I was very stressed out by this. Our product will allow users to not have to test the milk because we'll know the exact temperature of the milk once it's warmed. Our team uh, consists of myself. I'm a nurse. I work at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm also a graduate student here. Pat and Walt um, are engineers that both have experience bringing healthcare-related products to market. Um, and we also have Diane Spatz on as our product advisor. 
if you've ever been a student or worked at Penn, you've probably heard um, a lecture from Diane Spatz about the benefits of breastfeeding. Um, she's really renowned internationally, and we're really lucky to have her on our team. I also think it's really beneficial that I'm part of the target market that we're trying to reach. So we plan on selling each product for $99 each, and it only costs us about $32 to create our product, which gives us a $67 profit margin, which is very large. Uh, we plan on selling initially direct to consumer, so using our own website and Amazon um, to directly send to consumers in e-commerce platforms, but then also um, branch out to brick and mortar, so Target, uh, Walmart, Bye Bye Baby. We also plan on getting this accepted to be FSA or HSA approved, which basically means that you can buy this with tax-free money because it's a healthcare-related device. Um, all of these aspects of our product, I think, really make this have the potential of being one of the top gifts you could give at a baby shower event. So we're here today to ask for $10,000. Um, we still need to um, apply for a provisional patent because we are lacking funding, and that costs about $2,500 at this phase. Uh, we also want to test our prototype, which will cost about $5,000, and we also want to incorporate to protect ourselves and to protect our product, which should be about another $2,500. Does anyone have any questions? Great, thank you so much, Liz, for your pitch presentation. We'll bring all the judges back on. Please, judges, unmute your own uh, video audio. And who would like to ask the first question? Sure. So. How many women on, on a percentage basis are suffering from elevated? How many of them know it? Um, you know, just in terms of, you know, if you're trying, as you're trying to reach out to these folks, um, you know, people are even aware that they have this problem. Yeah, so um, there are currently no studies done um, that determine how many people have this problem. But if you do a quick online search or you join Facebook, you will find groups of thousands of people who um, exclusively pump and who have complained about having this problem. Um, so I'm in a couple of Facebook groups, some that have more than 40,000 people and having high light pace or having um, your infant refuse your frozen milk for reasons that you don't understand is a common thread there. Um, I do think there's definitely room to do more research there. Um, another aspect of making sure that we have enough of a target market is selling this as uh, a high safety bottle warmer also. But I think a lot of people who feed their infant at the breast might not ever find out they have high lipase because the milk composition hasn't changed because their infant is eating directly that fresh milk. So. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in real quick. And two questions. One, uh, getting back to Brett's question, if you don't know whether the uh, the, the, the reduction in acceptance is due, is due exclusively to lipase, high lipase levels or other factors. So you, it's really hard for me to judge what your actual universe is. If the, you know, those with high lipase only represents 1% of the population or 60% of the population of people who have low, accept, low acceptance. So that's one question. Second question is, you, you indicated that you have done some patent search. What are you hoping to patent? Is it the device, or are you actually going to make a claim about the reduction of lipase? We it's actually a have a couple. Oh, sorry. And obviously, very different kinds of pet regulatory pathways. Yeah, to answer your first question, um, I did my own research within the Facebook groups I'm in and asked how many people noticed that their infant was refusing frozen or long-term stored milk. And I got about 60% of people who responded and said it was an aspect that stopped them from being able to feed their infant frozen milk. And so we know it's growing and we know it's a problem. Um, there definitely needs to be more research done. Um, but to answer your second question, we actually have different routes in the IP world. So there are aspects of our idea that have not been used in milk warming at all. Um, I'm not sure if this is a 100% safe place to share those with you, um, but the IP attorney that we also talked to said the idea of 
decreasing lipase as a mechanism might also be a route we could take. And so I feel pretty confident in the different options we have, but I, we do have multiple ways in to, to get this IP. And we have time for one other question. If there are no others, uh, what's the status of the device? So we currently have a looks like model. Um, we got together right before COVID hit. And so we've all been meeting virtually. Um, so Walt has a 3D printer <clears throat> at his house and that's where our looks like prototype is. Um, we are excited to continue with our research. We've mostly just had funding restrictions at this point. But you're, you're but uh, Paul, pardon me for the follow up. You're sure though, if the device heats the milk to the temperature you're expecting that you will see this lipase decrease or you don't even know that? We do know that. And actually it's been interesting to find that most of the studies that have showed lipase decreasing have actually been pasteurization studies in NICUs. So there are many studies that show that specific temperatures for specific periods of time will decrease lipase. So we have um, an equation set up basically that will decrease lipase, but there are actually two, maybe even three different methods to decrease lipase in different ways. Um, so that's part of what our research would be um, including in the future. Great, thank you all so much, Liz. Thanks for your presentation. Thank Great you. Job. All right, so our final presentation is Dr. Amy Sawyer, Associate Professor of Sleep and Health Behavior at Penn Nursing, and Todd Joseph, Vice President of Growth at Memora Health, presenting Polly, their PAC Virtual Care Assistant. Anthony, if you can bring back up Rachel as well, that'd be great. And then judges, if you could please turn off your videos, that would be appreciated. Uh, Sherelle, could you turn off your video, please? Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We are delighted to introduce you to our solution, Polly, a positive airway pressure virtual care assistant. Positive airway pressure treatment, or PAP, is the primary treatment for sleep apnea. If we were to successfully treat all 29.4 million Americans with sleep apnea, an estimated $100 billion would be saved in healthcare costs alone, with additional savings for other societal costs like lost productivity. But PAP is challenging to use, and struggles with PAP lead to 50% or more of adults quitting the treatment or minimally using it. Minimal treatment use leads to additional healthcare costs like those associated with hospital readmissions. Care management is an effective solution for this costly and challenging problem. And if designed to scale, care management can be accessible to all those 29.4 million Americans with sleep apnea, as well as all 1 billion adults worldwide with sleep apnea. Our solution is Polly, a virtual care assistant for PAP users. Our PAP care management solution uses real-time data from patient devices to drive personalized and bi-directional interactions by SMS text messaging or email, and if indicated or needed, by televisit. By identifying those at risk for quitting the treatment or having low use, indicated by their actual metrics from their device, we can escalate individual cases for coaching and even brief behavioral therapies, all delivered by Polly. Interactive care management empowers patients by also giving them health literacy aligned education and access to guidance and coaching. This results in engaged patients which is a proven solution for treatment non-adherence, improved health and disease outcomes, and lower healthcare costs. Our solution leverages automation, 
to scale evidence-based care management that is delivered directly to PAP users with automated outreach that is responsive to patient replies and available 24-7. This is key because PAP use is at night when healthcare providers are not available, but when patients need help and support the most. Our team includes experts in sleep and health behavior, health literacy and innovative, innovation-driven health education, and care management technology. Together, we are the right team to fully prototype and bring to market our advisor in your pocket solution. So Poly will create significant value across the healthcare ecosystem. In the short term, the value propositions really center around the operational efficiency that can be achieved through uh, automating these care management activities and by proactively identifying patients at risk of falling behind in their therapy. Uh, this will be particularly attractive to standalone sleep centers who have just limited bandwidth to perform this outreach themselves. And that combined with the improved patient experience can really help them drive patient volume and retention. Uh, in the longer term, our, our focus shifts towards the payer market um, where we're uh, able to demonstrate uh, a savings of about $200 per patient per month for the payers uh, for folks who are effectively on and maintain with PAP therapy. And so of that $200, we plan to capture about $10 per patient per month. Um, and this brings our you know, total addressable market in the U.S. alone at about a uh, million dollars, uh, excuse me, a billion dollars. Uh, and keep in mind, um, you know, the, the market penetration for PAP use is only about 30 percent. So lots of room for growth in that in that side or excuse me, in that um, in the market. So the funding that we're going to use for from the uh, nursing innovation challenges will will primarily be to support the product development over the next 12 months. Uh, we'll be conducting recursive user testing to ensure that the product is actually meeting the needs of the sleep apnea users and their clinical teams. Uh, and once we've achieved sufficient levels of patient engagement and satisfaction, we'll move towards benchmarking the actual clinical efficacy. So the key to care management is really uh, effective patient engagement and just really being able to meet the patient where they are, when they need it, uh, and understand the challenges that they face. And to do this, we need to go beyond simply just monitoring PAP usage and sending prompts to the patient, and really instead communicate through a more natural and conversational way that allows us to pick up on more nuanced indicators of the patient, uh, patient experience. And this is something that none of our competitors have the ability to do, uh, not to mention that their services are extremely rigid, uh, given that their PAP usage goals derive primarily from arbitrary reimbursement milestones as opposed to actual clinical usage endpoints. Now, in the end, you know, our goal is to scale personalized care to, to effectively treat the billion people worldwide who actually need PAP therapy. Uh, we envision a world in which every single patient can actually have poly right in their pocket uh, to support them along their care journey. And with that, I'd like to thank you for the time. Would be happy to, to answer any questions that you all might have. Thanks again. Great, thank you both. Great presentation. All right, if we can have all of our judges come back on, turn your videos on, please. And um, whoever would like to ask the first question, please feel free. So it seems like you're, you're primarily looking at usage data right now, but what, if anything, can you do to get at the underlying causes of why people are stopping using their PAP? I mean, a, a lot of the issues with PAP are you know it's loud it's uncomfortable um you know it's it's not super friendly if you're there with a partner um so are, are there things you can do to to fight those issues or is it more just sort of a a nudge of you know hey you know you're supposed to be using this right so i've been um i've practiced in this space for 20 years uh, specifically focused on pap management and my research has spanned the past 20 years as well um, focus solely on PAP adherence and the promotion of it. And you're right, um, it's a complex scenario um, in terms of why does um, an individual use it or not use it. Um, but what we have done within our low fidelity prototype is taken the evidence-based interventions 
and our odd what what we want to do is automate those to be delivered to the individual and what we can do with the natural language processing by asking key questions is actually understand which approach would be best for which patient. Um, so for example, you brought up noise, the noise of the device. There are solutions that we can offer to people to use, and if they were asking the question or suggesting that was a problem, Polly can, can indicate to them, here are some ways to help with that. Um, what we find is that the barriers come up high at the beginning of treatment, which really sets the stage for people not using it. And so by being um, like in real time, being able to coach and deliver behavioral therapies, which we know improve use, we think um, that something like poly would improve PAP use um, at the outset and over the course of time. Um, let me ask a question, uh, two questions actually. Is your definition of, uh, or what is your definition of success? Is it strictly adherence? Is it, you know, and I want to hear what you have to say about that. But the second question I have is the companies that are manufacturing these, these machines now, and obviously, you know, Philips or, or ResMed, they're continually improving their devices because they hear the mm -hmm. same complaints that you hear all the time. It's noisy, it's not comfortable. It doesn't move with my head, you know, all the, all the usual stuff. If they get to the point where they've improved their machines, where the compliance goes up significantly, what does that do for your technology? Does that help it or does it hurt it? Or is mm -hmm. it neutral? So let me address your second question first. <laughs> so um, based on a, a large set of evidence to date, including industry's own studies, um, we have not moved the needle significantly on PAP adherence or PAP use outcomes being driven by these uh, technological improvements. Um, and so at this point, the devices are, are fairly quiet, they're, the masks on the market are more than a hundred different styles at this point, et cetera. Um, and yet we still see that we have an estimated 50% of people who either fail to use it at all or use it very minimally. Uh, so I don't think technology alone in terms of the device is going to move the needle a lot further than what we already have currently. Um, to address your first question about what is our definition of success, um, part of what we're seeking in terms of funding is um, to build out the high fidelity prototype and then use human-centered design while we are going through prototyping cycles to actually work with patients about their experience using this, um, using poly, and also with providers in terms of what they see um, in terms of um, um, observing the data through this system. Yeah, and I would just add a couple points to that. So um, I think in addition to the adherence as the endpoint uh, for us, uh, a goal of improving the actual patient experience of getting on the PAP therapy is, is something that's valuable to the to the sleep centers and clinicians who actually might want to buy the service. Um, so that's another uh, value add of, of having this component, even if you have uh, better steep, uh, better PAP uh, machines that actually are, are driving adherence. And then the second component is I also view the, the manufacturers not necessarily exclusively as competitors, but um, as potential partners for distribution for something like this, where they can have a tool like Poly as kind of a wraparound service that they have for their uh, PAP machines, similar to um, uh, um, um, a pharmaceutical company adding a wraparound service around one of their drugs or something like that. So I think that there's potential collaboration there as well um, and that this wouldn't go away. So we are over time. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> so thank you both for presenting. Great job. Okay, so thank you all, all of you for presenting your inspiring pitches. Um, judges, um, I'm now going to ask you to please exit this BlueJeans event and use the link that was provided to you earlier today in the email.
um, over at Zoom to begin your review of the pitches. I will join you all over there very shortly. That Zoom meeting um, is has begun, so you should be able to get in there no problem. Before I go, I'd like to welcome my colleague, Dr. Terry Richmond, Associate Dean for Research and Innovation at Penn Nursing, who's going to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Richmond, take it away. Thanks, Marion. Uh, I'm 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 thrilled to take I'm thrilled to take over the the uh, my job. And my can people see me, Anthony? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, I thanks. Terrific, terrific uh, presentations by all our innovation accelerator teams and fascinating problems and solutions. It just reinforces to me how nurses are so well positioned to tackle challenging problems about health and healthcare and create innovative solutions. I also want to acknowledge that several members of the Penn Nursing Board of Advisors and their innovation committee are with us today, and we are so grateful for your ongoing interest and support and ideas. So I get to introduce our keynote speaker, Ernesto Olguin. Ernesto exemplifies how ingenious nurses are and how committed nurses are to improving health and health care in vulnerable patients. Ernesto is a veteran. He started his healthcare career as a combat medic in the U.S. Army in 1994, and he soon became a licensed practical nurse in the U.S. Army. He subsequently pursued his associate degree and then his BSN, and he's a certified nephrology nurse. His 23 years of critical care and nephrology experience led to the development of multiple patented products. Ernesto has been recognized by Johnson & Johnson Nursing as an RN leading innovations and is featured on our own Design Thinking for Health platform website that's co-developed by Penn Nursing and the Rita and Alex Hillman Foundation for patenting the first ever diabetic foot care telehealth system. He is a dialysis clinical coordinator at Las Palmas Hospital and Las Palmas Rehabilitation Hospital and he hails from El Paso, Texas. So this is the joy of the virtual world. He is a clinical nurse, a nurse innovator, and an entrepreneur. He is the CEO of Oten Medical, which he founded in 2017. And what I love about Ernesto is as a clinical nurse, he saw that something was missing from the care of his patients with diabetes. And this really led to his passion and his development of his startup and his creation of his patented device. And he subsequently created other products. So he is just a, a serial innovator, a serial entrepreneur, and just a delightful man. And we are thrilled to have him here. So please join me in welcoming Ernesto Holguin. Thank you, Dr. Richmond, for the warm introduction. I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation. Can everybody see that? Yep, That's good. <laughs> good evening, faculty, staff, and participants. It is an honor to have been chosen as your keynote speaker. My name is Ernesto Olguin, CEO of O10 Medical. I have been a nurse for 25 years. I want to thank everyone for embarking into this wonderful profession. It is in these times that nurses are desperately needed and appreciated. Caring for others comes natural to me, and nursing is my true calling. However, I am also a maker nurse. And like everyone in this competition, I find myself wanting to improve our healthcare delivery, seeing the gaps that need to be addressed and compelled to make a difference. We all share the final goal of our patients returning to normalcy in a better state as quickly and safely as possible. This competition exemplifies how healthcare improvement and the impact of our profession will be forever changed. Today, I am going to discuss how I have brought three products from ideation 
to proof of concept, to prototyping, and to manufacturing, and finally to market. I hope that my journey will inspire you to create and to instill confidence in your own path. Now a little history. I am a first generation Mexican American with humble beginnings in El Paso, Texas. My nursing career began after joining the US Army in 1993. In 1995, I earned my licensed practical nurse. I joined right after high school and served a total of nine years. During my transition back to civilian life, I utilized my GI Bill and obtained my associate's degree in nursing. My first child was born and as a young father and like everyone else, I had to provide, making it difficult to attend school full time. Wanting to continue my nursing education, I began an online nursing program. After eight years, I earned my BSN from University of Phoenix. I have worked in many different fields. They include the intensive care unit, emergency room, medical surgical, labor and delivery, Alzheimer's, telemetry, and dialysis. In, in 2013, I became a certified nephrology nurse, and I am currently the dialysis clinical coordinator for two hospitals in El Paso. I finally found the occupation that most fulfills me and would later introduce me to innovate as an acute dialysis nurse. There I am on the far left with other maker nurses. In the summer of 2015, MIT had come to, our, to visit our hospital. Maker nurses have always existed. Society just hasn't given us the recognition we deserve. It is in recent years that corporations and universities have emphasized the significant role nurses bring to the table. It is rightfully owed that we have an input in product and procedure development since we are the discipline touching and nursing patients. It is this discipline that makes us overcome our battles with creativity and compassion. We play a vital role in people's lives. I'm going to share a story that has forever changed my outlook on nursing. I took care of a young mother who required weekly plasmapheresis treatments on an outpatient basis. She was a difficult stick, but she was always grateful for the care we gave her. Although we put her through severe pain, multiple needle punctures with 15 gauge fistula needles. Now with fistula needles, the smaller the number of gauge, the larger diameter they have. I refer to them as placing nails into people. I would often wonder how she could keep a straight face and not yell at us at all. One day she disclosed that she loved coming with us because she knew that we would never stop trying to stick her properly until we were successful. She further shared that her children needed her more so than anyone else in their lives, and enduring the pain was worth it. Bringing me to the present, this story collectively demonstrates how nurses are key players in improving our healthcare delivery because we do not stop until we succeed. We have been continually executing this since the beginning of our nursing profession. Nursing has been a way of caring for the ill when the Baxters, the J&Js, and the Cardinal Healths were not always there to supply us with essential items. My next slide shows two examples of how nursing techniques have evolved and improved patient care. Here are a few pictures illustrating how to perform CPR and restraining a child in 1937. Yanking the arms of a person up and down while someone else held the tongue forward, hoping to stimulate spontaneous breathing. Holding a child helplessly while performing an assessment was acceptable and the standard. We as nursing professionals have continually improved on concepts and treatments. This is in part of nurses innovating and continuously challenging current treatments and procedures. A great deal of trial and error mixed with compassion towards our customers have driven nursing forward. The most important thing out of the nursing evolution is being to systematically communicate updated information to other nurses. Without doing this, our ideas and novel innovation will stay stagnant. Unfortunately, great ideas have stayed in departments or within a small group of nurses because of fear of speaking up or retaliation from administration. 
And then there was my aha moment. I went to pick up a patient for hemodialysis, a patient that was irregular. She was a lovely lady with good family support. I asked her, what happened? She replied in Spanish, Mijo, tengo una ulcera en el pie. Son, I have a foot ulcer. I asked her if she checked her feet after each shower, and she said that she could not bend over and be able to see her feet. She had poor vision as a secondary cause of her diabetes. What about your husband checking for you? I asked. She said, honey, he's in the same boat as I am. What about your children? And she proceeded to tell me that they were too busy with their own children and were not around after her showers. I asked her how she knew she had a foot ulcer then, and she replied, I smelled it. This person had to go through two senses to know something was wrong with her foot. At that moment, I did what any nurse would do. I dug deeper into her activities of daily living and analyzed her challenges. Keep in mind that by the time I saw her wound, it was very deep, infected, with an odor that smelled of infection. She needed intense medical attention. It was this moment, moment of desperation and despair that left me feeling like something must be done. I felt compelled to do something. I brainstormed, daydreamed, and then became motivated to draw up my ideas at home. My conclusion was that a monitoring system was needed for the continuation of care after hospital discharge. This would assist in the rendering of healing wounds and serve as a preventive measure for people with diabetes. Could there be such a device? Was there a device out there? And if so, where could I, where could I find, find one? I didn't do internet search. I just asked my fellow wound care colleagues and there wasn't any device in existence, such I had imagined. I came home and began to invent my device. My patent processes. I want to make sure my patients would benefit from my idea to its fullest. The patent process was extensive and painstaking. I didn't know where to begin after I drew up my idea on paper. A couple of days later, I saw a commercial advertising ideas and getting your own patent. I immediately called the invention home company. At this point, I needed to consult my wife since the financial commitment was substantial. My wife, Yvonne, heard me out and without hesitancy, she said, go for it, let's do this. I was reassured and proceeded with it. I took out a loan on my 401k and we hoped for the best. Now working with them was a detailed experience I am glad I had to go through. I had to explain how everything worked together in order to determine if my idea was an original one. If you're looking into a patent, be prepared to go back and forth with the graphic designer and the attorney. Now Invention Home had a policy which did not allow you to know which companies they were pitching your ideas to and had a platform informing you the status of responses. The commitment was for one year, and after that point, you have to decide to pay more in order to continue receiving their services. As you could tell, I did not have a good experience with this. But there was one thing that, could, that came out of it. I was contacted by their patent attorneys and graphic designers who helped me draft my first utility patent. I learned that there are two ways of submitting a patent. Number one way, submit yourself. Number two way, have a patent attorney submit. Please choose number two. It will save you multiple headaches plus precious time and money. Attention to detail is essential and multiple revisions are required, but that was not the difficult part. The waiting was the worst. I waited for almost three years before I knew my patent would be approved or not. This means that during these years, I had a patent pending. Although I had a patent attorney oversee my patent, it still did not guarantee it being approved for the first time around. A pushback from the United States Patent and Trademark Office will only cost me more money and wait longer. Now this slide I call it making and breaking. Revisiting MIT's visit, Maker Nurse motivated me to put my patent into the works. After multiple drawings and much contemplation, I gathered home items and began building a large wooden box with holes on top of the platform an electric blower built into it, which was controlled by a remote control Christmas lights outlet. This took about two weeks to build, and I didn't know if it was gonna function or not, but that wasn't the point. 
My patient's wound dilemma, combined with the perfect amount of encouragement, had me working on my first invention. I placed it in our bedroom and tested how well it dried my feet after each shower. This bulky box lasted maybe two weeks before my wife kicked it out and moved it into the garage. The thing worked for the next couple of years. The maker nurse's continuous encouragement had me making more prototypes, and each time my invention was becoming more of a practical device that I could see working in the world. An essential element in my progress was having family support. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. To continue with my ideas, I needed more financial assistance. My wife again heard me out, challenged me, gave me options, and supported me many of times. I also received emotional support, encouragement, and love. The business classes I took every Thursday cut into our family time. The events that I participated in different cities were combined with our family vacations. The rambling on of my frustrations and worries were received without hesitancy of a loving person, person hear, hearing me out. A spouse's support makes the success complete. There are limitations and my wife knows exactly how to balance our lives. I make it a point to address her support because it has immense value to my work. I am going to play a short podcast clip I recently took part in this last December, speaking about my wife's support. With building my ideas, I had this misconception that I would have someone else make my invention I, and I would collaborate with them in the process and it would be the most wonderful experience in the world. I was wrong. It was back to square one, trying to find something local. In the meantime, what I was doing was telling people I work with all my patent process pains and frustrations, but they could not really help me either. Luckily, in the summer of 2015, Mako nurse from MIT visited my hospital. They came to a little city at the edge of Texas, and I couldn't believe it. My director found out that they wanted to speak to nurses that were makers, and he called me down to meet with them. It was awkward since no other nurses in the room were speaking when asked questions, and they were just listening to the presenters. Maker Nurse began by sharing a pamphlet that illustrated how to make them almost any supply to carry out procedures and properly care for your patients from the early 1900s. I just happened to have two copies of my patent with me, which I shared with them. I received praise and encouragement to start the prototyping. I had never thought of doing it myself, and my main concern was how to create the electronic and computing part of the project. One of the presenters was a brilliant engineer that taught me computer programming and he helped me start the software. I was introduced to the Raspberry Pi, which I later learned the basic coding skills. Remember, I had never dealt with coding or prototyping of large devices. I conquered and learned many tasks that were foreign to me. There's my little girl standing on my first prototype in the backyard. I transitioned from the wooden box to the PVC tubing covered with plexiglass platform and a tablet as seen in picture two. Then the prototype that a person stands on the platform to dry their feet and a camera to capture images of your feet in picture three. I continued to make more prototypes and each time they became smaller and lighter with working sensors that were able to transmit 
images to whichever email I programmed it to go to. During this time, I am still a full-time nurse with little experience in prototyping, but if there's a will, there is always a way. As you can see, this slide shows the results of my hard work. I started thinking, how am I going to come up with seed money? I started doing research on competitions and I applied for my first competition in the beginning of 2017 named Infosys. It was looking for makers with great ideas to help the masses, especially underserved people. Lo and behold, I won. I was awarded seed money to start my project and the following month that summer, I won another competition. I won the proof of concept competition in my hometown at the Medical Center of the Americas, MCA. I also won seed money and free dry lab, stay, lab space to start my project. I was amazed at the streak of good luck and I was hooked. The MCA also provided business classes and by the end of 2017, I had begun my business, Oten Medical LLC. As I'm saying this, I can hear how that may seem easier than what it is. Let it be known that this process took hundreds of hours and lots of time was spent on the computer. I will wake up early before heading to work and fill out applications and work on my business. Upon returning from my 12 to 16 hour shift, I would sit myself down and continue doing more research and applications. I labored a lot to enter these competitions, hoping to raise money for my idea. I wanted to see patients receive better care. I had many thoughts, ideas, and inspirations. I would have to say that determination and perseverance is what drove me to keep going. I wanted my idea to be real and tangible. Pitch competitions are frightening and intimidating. You are placed in front of judges that determine who will get funded, and you are solely judged on how well you present yourself. The less than five minute presentation equates to weeks, months of hard work shown by PowerPoint presentations or graphs that are perfect for the pitch. This does not include the work you placed on your business idea and the large amount of time and money spent. A huge risk that is significant, heartbreaking, and costly. I say with firsthand experience. One time my family and I decided to go to Austin for a pitch competition, which is about nine hours away, 10 with kids. This competition only allowed 10 competitors. Upon arrival, they did not allow anyone in until a short time before the competition. This was only creating more stress. You start looking around to see the other competitors and your thoughts just start rushing. You not only pitch in front of the judges, but also the other competitors. You have this burning desire to win, but you know there's a chance you may not. Needless to say, I did not win this competition and the loss was crushing. My wife and children could feel the devastation in me our whole demeanor changed and we returned to the hotel spiritually drained and stomped on. It is discouraging, in fact upsetting, as you try to justify every move in your mind or hit yourself for not saying that one right thing. Either way, one might think that this would have stopped me, but I live by a rule. I allow myself to feel bad for one day, then I continue. We have to realize that we need to go through these endeavors in order to learn and grow. I learned that not all competitions were geared for my idea. I had to do better filtering and vetting. I also accepted that people and investors need more education in this field. Now there are angel investors, startup investors, and investors looking for company growth of a successful product. I pitched to all types of investors. After each pitch, I felt like this is it. I was asked great questions, praised for my wonderful ideas. I am definitely getting funded. Now multiply that instance and feeling times 150, yet a second me meeting needs to be conducted and still no funding. Don't get me wrong, I have not given up. I do expect to someday get funded. The first Maker Faire I was asked to participate in was in New York. Coming from El Paso, this was a huge deal. Maker nurse from MIT were hosting nurse makers from all around the United States. My wife and I gave up tickets to see the Rolling Stones in concert that weekend to attend the Maker Fair, but we had a blast. People from all over the country attended and we experienced being amongst other makers with different goals in mind. 
My wife quickly learned about diabetic foot ulcers and soon enough was helping me speak to people at her booth. We spoke to physicians, nurses, wound care nurses, people with ulcers, and children with parents having this problem. We consoled crying mothers and mourning son sons during these events. It was eye-opening to see that what happens in a small hospital in El Paso is also happening throughout the United States. Here's my latest prototype for the remote diabetic foot monitoring system. During customer discovery with my patients about their activities of daily living, I was curious as to what factors contributed or hindered to the healing of their diabetic foot ulcer. I was interested in the obstacles and challenges they faced and how well they could take care of themselves, who was present when it came time to do their dressing changes and who would supervise their needs. I looked at it from a nurse's perspective and the responses given had many commonalities. I was investigating why many patients return with worsening wounds, hence I wanted to address these gaps in the system. Knowing this information was essential and gave me insight to building a device to fit these needs. I was not the first person who wanted to address these problems, but I was the first nurse to understand how nursing at home needs to be part of their curriculum and asking other healthcare disciplines for their input. I later realized that I was performing customer discovery before I knew what the term was. This slide shows a 3D rendering of what I imagine the remote diabetic foot monitoring system will look like. Engineers are given problems, find wonderful ways to create and give solutions, and this system works great for the industrial or commercial arena. However, meeting nursing needs does not only involve engineering work. It is the nurse who can quickly identify the problems with our current healthcare delivery. Nurses work with what we have. We go into a supply room to gather a variety of items that work cohesively and create a new supply. We also imagine ways to improve current techniques and procedures in much more effective ways than engineers. Don't get me wrong, we need engineers to work on the specifics, but the ideas come from us. I have three products that I have invented in patent. My first patent is the remote device that will monitor people with diabetes. This device is in their home and they have acquired a diabetic foot ulcer, which is healing and or is deemed high risk and developing an ulcer. I have taken this project as far as I can take it, I need a turnkey manufacturer to assist in the final process, which is costly. There are interested investors who would like to see the project more advanced before they fund. On account of cost, I have pivoted my company to products that are less costly to bring to market. This pivot is in the hopes of self-funding the remote diabetic foot monitoring system. This slide shows when I was taking measurements and working on my design. This second pattern is in intravenous and ventilator tube holder and organizer for hospital use. It keeps IV lines from the floor and entanglement. This product keeps the IV lines in nurses view and organized. I developed this technology through trial and error using a 3D printer. I was able to manufacture these two products and have filled orders. The slide shows the, the first products that I have manufactured. The interesting point of these products is that they also assist by organizing the IV lines with the IV pumps outside the COVID rooms. This decreases the need to enter the room frequently, thus reducing the use of PPE and staff exposure. I call this supply the I lines, and it is a business to business product. Here is a short clip of my I line advertisement. Hi, Ernesto, when you play things, we're not getting audio from them. Oh, okay. Um, the audio doesn't really matter on this one. Okay. My third pattern is a CPAP host holder for home use. It keeps the hose away from clutching on furniture, allows for better movement in bed, and overall better night's rest. Again, 
With this product, I 3D printed the parts until it was ready to be manufactured. I performed a series of product testing with subjects that utilize CPAP machine. Much time was given to the questionnaires and answer process. I took their suggestions and comments and changed the product to meet the general needs. It was a painstaking process, but well worth it. By the time I present this keynote, the CPAP host holder will be close to assembly and ready for sales. This product is straight business to consumer. Sacrifices are going to be made. You must make contributions in different ways aside from work. Your personal and family time, monetary, sleep, vacationing, leisure times are all going to be affected. Many of us know people that stop dead on their tracks once they encounter a bump on the road. They, they are dreaming of making medical changes that rather be dreamers. Working towards a goal and having the drive to do so is a special gift. You have to find your own drive. Determine the sacrifices you're willing to make and balance your life. This isn't to say that problems aren't going to arise, but that's the nature of the, be the beast. As we were starting this adventure, my wife and I encountered much negativity, but we also knew to allow people to speak their mind and be prudent in our responses. We also believe that the work that is dedicated is our work and our choice. In closing, on a daily basis, I see many patients suffer. Considering how medically advanced we are, I see my patients with the same preventable problems that ultimately take their lives. I find this to be very disturbing. Change happens when there is a need for improvement through communication, testing, implementation, and outcomes. Desperate deci decisions can impose changes that are not always for the best. Last year, we had to make drastic changes on doubling up ventilator patients, triaging COVID positive patients in hallways, and sharing same oxygen tubing. Makeshift devices such as converting the CPAP machines and artificial manual breathing units, ambu bags, into ventilators were also considered. This type of last effort innovation should be avoided, and preparation needs to take precedence when anticipating chaos. In all of your efforts to improve our healthcare system, please consider this. The end user will need to benefit from your novel ideas that are cost responsible and that can be applied to the masses. As we are servants to the ill, neglect, neglected, and underserved. Thank you. Oh, Ernesto, what a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous presentation. So thank you so much. I will, um, if people have questions, we'll have a couple minutes and we can put them in our, in our uh, Q&A. But I'll start, I'll start with the first question. Um, you alluded to this, I have many questions, but you clearly, you saw a, a, a clinical problem and you wanted to solve it. But a lot, but you face a lot of failure, right? And I like that I give myself a day and then I have to like start again. How do we really um, help people and help nurses to say, failure's, you know, we hear failure's good. Like failure's good. Like try something, you can fail, it's good. But boy, it doesn't feel good. So what other what other recommend uh, advice do you have on how do you really stick with it? I stuck with it and I've been sticking with it because the of the end user, my uh, patients. I see them on a daily basis with their ulcers getting worse, and that keeps me from wanting to continue, even through different failures, different you know not getting the the funding during pitch competitions, but just seeing them and seeing the need reminds me that I need to keep on going. And I don't, I'm not doing this for monetary reasons. I'm doing this for, for the patients. They need to live a better life and continuously improving their, their healthcare delivery will get them there, will improve their lives. 
So, so, oh, I love everything about what you're talking about. I've seen in our comments, what an honest presentation. You know, so I'm just, I'm being the voice of people that I'm hearing comments. I'm very inspiring. You know, the, the pitch competitions are scary things. They, they are scary. And you commented on, you have to start to vet and figure out what are the right competitions for you. How do you really make that, de that decision, that determination? Through research, um, the company that's providing the pitch competition, if their agenda is gearing towards a different area that does not apply to your invention, then I would suggest not not to um, enter it unless it's it's a free competition. Then you know, having that uh, exercise, the going through the pitch, it does certainly help you with other pitches. But if if it means that you have to pay so much money to enter that competition, then I would steer clear away from that and enter the competitions that are more geared to what your uh, invention is. And, and I think our judges are coming back, but I'm going to ask another question. And Mary, and when you're back, you can tell me when I have to stop. Um, oh, so I'm, I'm going to ask somebody else's question versus mine. Do most competitions cost money? I would say 50% of them do cost money, and it, for good reasons, that they need to pay the judges, they need to pay the platform when, before uh, COVID happened, you know, they needed to fly them in. So I understand the reason why they do ask for, for, for uh, money to pitch your idea. Um, but there are some that are free that obviously you could enter and, and see, practice your pitch and see how well you perform in that area, get the feedback from the judges and go back and improve your, your pitch also. So it does help. Okay, and, and yeah, people are loving your product. So, uh, Mary, and I have to ask another question and then, all right. So, um, I like your IP organizer very much. How much does it cost? For the eyeline, the smaller one, it's uh, 250 per unit. And okay. the one with the ventilator uh, holder and the IV line is uh, $3. So okay. it, it, it is on sale on my website on otenmedical.com, and they could purchase straight from there if they would like to. Terrific. So everybody hear that, I hope. Okay. Terrific. Marion, are you? Are we having to stop? I think so, yes. Okay. Can, well, can I just say, and, and since you've missed this and the judges missed this, Ernesto did a fabulous presentation, inspiring honest, just absolutely fabulous. So Ernesto, thank you so very much um, for being with us and sharing uh, really a phenomenal, um, uh, your stories and the phenomenal experience that you bring to this. So thank you so much. Thank you and thank you for inviting me. It has been an honor for me to be your keynote speaker. Great. Well, thank you both. Thank you, Ernesto. Thank you, Dr. Richman. I hope you all enjoyed Ernesto's talk. Uh, it looks like you did. I am personally a big fan of him and his work and can't wait to watch the recording of his presentation. All right. I'd like to now just recap our four presentations uh, using the live sketches created by the talented Rachel Acker from Health Hero. Um, Ivory, if you could share your screen and show those sketches while I review. So first off, we had Dr. Kimberly Trout, Stephanie Madri, and Dr. James Weimer with their postpartum hemorrhage detection application. Our uh, second presentation was Sarah Cronin and Brooke Goodspeed with the Stay Safe product for children with autism at risk for elopement. Our next presentation was Liz Harbuck and her innovation, Milkies. And finally, we had Dr. Amy Sawyer and Todd Joseph with Polly, their PAP virtual care assistant. All right, so I just want to say thank you um, to all those who presented. You are all winners tonight, even if you don't get awarded. 
um, please continue, please reach out, please consider resubmitting next year. Um, I'm happy to help, all of us here at Penn Nursing are happy to help encourage you and um, support you moving forward. With that, I'd like to introduce Rich Panola, one of our esteemed judges, and the co-chair of the Penn Nursing Innovation Committee who will announce the winners. Thank you, Marion. Um, can you hear me? Because I see your face on the screen. Hello, but I can hear you. Maybe you speak up slightly. Okay. Well, uh, again, thanks to everybody for uh, making this happen. If you think about uh, pen nursing and innovation, uh, Tony's comments at the front end, uh, it's, it's what has been a central theme of not only the nursing school and its expanded curriculum, but also part of uh, the fundraising that went on in the capital campaign. Uh, there is a, a very, very large commitment uh, to innovation at Penn Nursing. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, with the panel of judges that uh, you saw uh, and uh, their expertise. I would share with you that the discussions were very robust and insightful in our Zoom breakout room, everything virtual. And uh, we tried to discuss every single pitch in, in some great, great detail. Uh, also, Mary and I would point out uh, that some of the judges that uh, were a part of this have offered to uh, help mentor and maybe bring some other ideas and aspects to uh, some of the projects that have been pitched. So I, th I think it's a, a very opportune time for everybody. So uh, again, thanks to everyone. So, so to award the prizes, the second place prize goes to Stay Safe. It was looked upon as an idea and an innovation that is practical, scalable, and if it really, really works, it can uh, be applied to other disciplines that have similar issues of elopement and running away. Uh, the judges have decided to award you $5,000 for the progress and, uh, of your project. Uh, we, we think you're doing something dear to your hearts and something that is really, really part of the common good and your applications uh, the efficacy of it, uh, we think actually could be applied to other uh, disciplines and problems as well. So congratulations. Uh, you may, may you keep up the good work and uh, keep it moving along the spectrum. <laughs> no pun intended. So <laughs> uh, thank you very much. So the next uh, uh, prize is the first prize. And after... Uh, a, a lot of, of really, really good discussions, and I would say very, very enthusiastic discussions about the future of this uh, project. Uh, we have decided to award first place prize of $10,000 to the postpartum hemorrhage solution. And uh, it is seen as something that fits so many, so many uh, applications today uh, because it hits the minority groups, it hits globalization for the, you know, the least, least uh, available people and those who need it the most. Uh, there were a lot of questions and a lot of judges have a lot of good ideas that I would ask you to work through to Marion uh, to get their ideas. They're, they're really great and it caused uh, a great deal of excitement for uh, a lot of people to be able to use that service and to figure out those algorithms and how they work and uh, what really sets off the care that's necessary after you find that there is a problem. Uh, we think you have a long way to go, but we hope the $10,000 uh, gets you off on a, a good start to it. So thank you, thank you very much for your presentation. And Marion, I'll turn it back to you. 
Great. Congratulations to you both. Congratulations to both teams. Congratulations to all of you who pitched tonight. Um, I just want to end by thanking a lot of people. This couldn't happen without a great team. So I'd like to thank, again, everybody who participated and made this event possible. Um, also, I'd like to thank Dean Tony, Dr. Richmond, Dr. Demiris, and Melissa Kelly, who've been big supporters of this event, our speakers and judges, as well as my colleagues at Penn Nursing who helped, um, including our ITS department, our events department, and our marketing communications team. I'd also like to thank Thomas and Carolyn Bennett, Seth Gins, and Andrea Laporte, who helped fund this event. And finally, participants for our participants for sharing their innovations today. I hope they inspire more nurses to begin creating solutions to the problems they see in their own practice. Keep innovating and please reach out um, if you are a nurse out there, a student who wants to take an idea from conception to implementation here at Penn Nursing, we're here to help. So good night, thank you all and stay safe.